Um, good morning, everybody, uh, and welcome to CSIS. I'm glad you could join us today. My name is Carl Meacham, and I am the director of the Americas program. And uh, I want to welcome you to what I think uh, is probably one of the most interesting events that we're going to be having this fall. As you know, today we'll be talking about Latin America and the context uh, of the U.S. midterm elections. Uh, I imagine that some of you aren't entirely sure why this region uh, is relevant to the midterms. Um, I, I guess uh, that most of you assume that the majority of this event will be about immigration reform, and, and sure, some of it will be about immigration reform, uh, and uh, we'll be talking about it today uh, for sure in this discussion, but what we're hoping to impart is uh, a different message, not that immigration is uh, the only issue that makes Latin America relevant uh, to U.S. elections, but that it's one of many. Uh, there are, in reality, a series of issues that are intermestic in nature. That is, that they are relevant both to foreign policy and domestic politics. Immigration is certainly one of those intermestic issues, uh, and it's key, especially in these midterms. But U.S.-Cuba policy, our relationship with Venezuela, energy security, trade and commerce, these are all regional uh, issues that have a large and growing electoral relevance here in the United States. Uh, so let's look at the uh, context that we're operating in first. Uh, last year has seen upwards of 70,000 unaccompanied children, primarily from Central American countries, illegally cross into the United States across our southern border. Panama recently invited Cuba to the upcoming Summit of the Americas meeting, calling into question that forum and the U.S.'s role in it. The ongoing political crisis in Venezuela has repeatedly made headlines here in the United States largely because of the country's role in energy stability and transnational crime throughout the region. Uh, that isn't to say that these developments are taking center stage here. Uh, issues of truly global scale, like the threat of ISIL and the Russia-Ukraine conflict, will still dominate media coverage and campaign talking points. Everyone is looking at those issues and how they will develop, and that's inevitable. But Latin America should be a U.S. foreign policy uh, priority, too. On the one hand, I say that because it deserves the prioritization in substantive terms. Uh, on the other hand, given changing demographics here and how those changes will impact electoral maps, the issues related to the region will only become more and more important. Latin America is, in simplest terms, uniquely relevant to the United States. This comes from a variety of factors, markets and their importance to our prosperity, security, proximity, and of course, our evolving demographic makeup. In terms of prosperity, the numbers speak for themselves. The U.S. took in about $180 billion in imports from Latin America in 2013 and sent the region uh, $160 billion in exports. Natural resources development and energy reform in Mexico improves U.S. energy security as well. And our production chains are deeply integrated as well. Thanks to NAFTA, 40% of goods labeled made in Mexico contain components manufactured here in the United States. As far as proximity goes, the U.S.-Mexico border is 2,000 miles long. Flying to Venezuela takes about 3.5 or 3.5 hours, and Cuba is 90 miles from Florida. This should give you an idea of how close we truly are. Because of that geographic closeness, violence and drug trafficking in the region inevitably reverberate northward. Transnational criminals in Mexico smuggle people and contraband northward, and illegal weapons move south implying that maintaining security on our border is a shared responsibility. As a result, most of U.S. foreign policy funding in the region is channeled into cooperative security frameworks, including, for example, the Merida Initiative. And cooperative security arrangements, uh, or, uh, it, which is a cooperative security arrangement with Mexico. These issues of, of drug trafficking and violence are connected to our own security, not just at the border. So substantively, the region is key to U.S. interests, even if it doesn't always garner the crisis-driven attention we see paid to other global hotspots. The changing demographics here in the United States speak to the second issue. Whether or not Latin America should be a foreign policy priority, it is inevitable that issues related to the region will become relevant to elections here, midterms and presidential alike. What do those demographics look like, though? About 2.5 million immigrants from all over the world have entered the U.S. since 2007. Half are from Latin America. As, demogra as a demographic group, people of Latino origin make up nearly one-fifth of the U.S., and they are the fastest-growing minority group, and they play a unique role in U.S. politics. The group is growing fast and increasingly relevant in key electoral districts. 
And in the con uh, contrast to many of other uh, demographic groups, Latino Americans often care about policy issues here in the US that impact their countries of origin. So in the immediate electoral context, what does that mean? Geographically, most Latinos live in states with sizable communities. Arizona, California, Colorado, Florida, Illinois, New Mexico, New Jersey, New York, and Texas. Five of those states have contested midterms where Latinos could make a difference. We're gonna go into that in detail in this panel. But all, all, all nine will be key in 2016. Uh, but let's look at Colorado as an example of this. Colorado's U.S. Senate race is closely contested, and nearly 15% of the electorate is Latino. Many say that that race has been made closer by President Obama's decision to delay an executive action on immigration. And, uh, and for or immigration more generally, the numbers speak for themselves. Latinos are 25% more likely to support immigration reform than the general populace, and over three quarters of them factor it into their voting habits. Even Latinos unaffiliated with either party overwhelmingly support immigration reform, and it is these voters that can make a huge impact in election years. In 2012, President Obama won the support of three quarters of the country's Latinos, and 53% of all Americans. His popularity has certainly decreased overall, but we have to look at the spread uh, when it, with regards to um, these issues as a whole. Uh, and on the issues with Latinos in particular, the president's support has dipped uh, significantly. I'm not going to get into the numbers because I think the panel here will have their views, uh, particularly on, on, on some of these issues. And I would just say that uh, immigration is just one of these uh, intermestic issues uh, that will be relevant uh, to U.S. electoral politics. Um, I think I've taken enough time in the opening, and I'm sure uh, that our panelists will have different views. So what I'm going to do right now is provide quick introductions to our panelists, and then we're going to get on with, with our event today. So moderating this event, we're going to have Manuel Roig Franzia, who's a long-term uh, or a long-time Washington Post writer. He's been bureau chief in the paper uh, in Miami, in Mexico City, and he's an accomplished author. I'm thrilled to have him here to moderate today's discussion. Thank you. Glad to be here. Great. Uh, Luis Miranda, to my right, is co-founder and managing director of MDC Strategies, a communications and public advocacy consulting firm. He served as spokesman and communications advisor to President Obama, as the deputy communications director at the DNC as well, and on numerous campaigns. Welcome. Thank you. Gustavo Arnavat is the senior advisor here at CSIS. He served as the U.S. executive director at the Inter-American Development Bank, as a senior member of the Treasury Department's international affairs team. In addition to his background in international law and banking, I would say that you served uh, as, uh, as a political designee or appointment during the Obama administration, correct? Mm -hmm. Welcome. And my good friend and colleague here at CSIS, Dan Rundy, who holds the Schreyer Chair here at CSIS and is the director of CSIS's Project on Prosperity and Development. He's worked uh, at the International Finance Corporation as head of the Foundation's Unity, and he served as the director of the Office of Global Development Alliances at USAID during President Bush. Correct? Yep. Welcome. So I'm thrilled that all four of you are here. All four of you are here, yes. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to Manuel uh, for his uh, opening. I would remind you all that we are on the record, and we are lucky to be covered today by C-SPAN. So for all you C-SPAN nerds out there, Say hello to mom. Anyway, <laughs> for you. Thanks very much, Good. Carl. Um, so we're going to have a conversation about two words that begin with P-O-L, politics and policy, and they're connected. Uh, and I've been a reporter at the Washington Post for a long time. One of the fundamentals of journalism is that you don't make predictions. Never, never make predictions. They, they catch up with you. So I'd like to start today by making a prediction. <laughs> That prediction is this. The first Latino president of the United States is alive, has been born. That first Latino president might be a member of Congress. She might be a first grader in Texas. He might be a high schooler in California. But that person is alive. We're looking at the midterm elections. The midterms are always a test run for the presidential election. And as we work through our distinguished panel here, I think we should be keeping an eye on the connection between those two big events, November 2014, November 2016. 
So we should start with the Honorable Gustavo. <laughs> Thank you, Manuel. Well, given that the, uh, the average lifespan uh, of an American is roughly what, 74, 78 years old, depending on whether you're male or, or, or female, I would hope your prediction is, uh, is very accurate. Uh, so, uh, we, you know. Check uh, with me in 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> so let me just start by saying that yesterday there was a, a, a debate for the governor's race in New Mexico. Um, and this Friday, there's going to be one in Florida. This is part for the course at uh, this time of the year, except that both debates are in Spanish. And I think this uh, indicates the kind of interest there is on the part of it of the politicians to reach out to the Hispanic community. In states like New Mexico, the population, about, about a half the population is Hispanic. In Florida, it's about a quarter. Um, but uh, it's not just states um, that are traditionally associated with, uh, with Latinos, like, like uh, Carl mentioned Colorado, New Mexico, Florida, et cetera, that have high percentages of uh, Hispanics. Um, almost, uh, almost half the states in the United States uh, but half, about uh, roughly 90% or more of the population is Hispanics. And you have in, over, uh, in, in, in states like Connecticut, Hawaii, Georgia, Idaho, Kansas, Nebraska, Oregon, and Utah, over 10% of the population is Hispanic. Not, not all of them are registered, not all of them are, are eligible to register, but over time, uh, the percent of those individuals who are of Hispanic uh, descent um, who can vote uh, will, will increase. Uh, and I think that you know, getting really to the, to the, to the heart of what this um, panel is about is, to what extent do Hispanics uh, vote um, uh, in ways that further their interests related to their, their countries of origin? Uh, and I would argue that increasingly, uh, first of all, you have a lot of Hispanics, roughly about a third of Hispanics living in the United States were not born in the United States. They were born uh, in, uh, in Latin America, except for Ted Cruz, who was born in Canada. Um, and so, but in increasingly, these individuals are, 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 are very interested in seeing that U.S. policy reflects their interest, uh, and on the development front, on the security front, uh, et cetera, which hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get into. So I think it's going to be an issue. You know, is Latin America on the ballot today or this November? It's not. Uh, but I think increasingly, um, issues having to do with uh, relating to Hispanics, linked to the country's origin, uh, will, will will become more and more important. Before we move on to Dan, could I ask you a quick question? Can we even say that there is a quote unquote Hispanic or Latino electorate in the United States? Does that exist as a single entity? That's a great question. And 10 years ago, I would have said no. I would have said that the so-called Hispanic vote is actually fairly fragmented, is very idiosyncratic, really depends on the country of origin of individuals. But I would say that the immigration issue has really galvanized the Hispanic community in ways that I haven't seen before. I, you know, I was born in Cuba, spent my early you know, formative years there, grew up in Miami. And I would say, you know, by and large, many of the Cubans you know, that I grew up with saw themselves primarily as Cubans. When I got to college, I met folks from other parts of, of Latin America, uh, and they considered themselves either primarily Puerto Rican or Dominican or Mexican American. I would say, and this is totally anecdotal, I think the immigration issue has caused a lot of Hispanics to feel that they are part of this embattled group and they need to stick together. They're not going to agree on everything, of course, but that, that's my general sense. All right. Okay. okay. Great. Thanks for having me. Um, just a couple of context issues. I, I think the way in which some of these intermestic issues, and we're going to get into what that means in a minute, uh, play themselves out at a local level. I think we need to have a little bit of context about what are vote moving issues today in uh, in this midterm, if you, I'm looking at the Washington Post before I came here, and it said 19% said the economy, 12% said terrorism, 8% said immigration. That was that was October 1, and that's the Washington Post AP GFK poll top issues in the midterm election. I went back though in July, and there was immigration actually was the number one issue in July in in some of the polls. I think here in Gallup, and I think it had to do with some of the news about. Uh, children cross un, uh, children uh, crossing the border. So it, it first we have to understand that there's volatility in in polling in terms of what public opinion is thinking about. But I also think I think as as was said earlier, this I would not say Latin America is on the ballot. And so I think we have to you know for those of us who think about international affairs issues or are particularly energized about issues in Latin America, we may care about it. But in West Virginia's second congressional district, it's not a vote moving issue per se. And there are going to be certain ways in which it is expressed. But I think we need to be a little bit careful about how and where it's going to be expressed. It will be locally expressed in different ways 
uh, as well. I do think, um, I will share a couple of anecdotes though, and then I want to talk about a couple of intermestic issues that I think would, are worth describing. Whenever I've raised the issue, um, I speak to a lot of members of Congress and a lot of folks running for governor, and oftentimes, I'm the one that has to prompt the conversation about international affairs, not because they're not globally aware, not because they're not cosmopolitan, not because they're not sophisticated. It's just, as I was just describing to you earlier, it is not a vote-moving issue. Now, for those of us who are in think tanks, it is fascinating and interesting or the, you know, when we invest our time, but we need to understand that there are, there, it's, it's part of a larger context. Let me tell you a story, though. I asked Governor Christie two weeks ago, I said, tell me about your trip to Mexico. And he went on for 10 minutes and it was in a very sophisticated uh, account of, his, of, of Mexico. He said, I think the Mexican leadership is sophisticated. It's um, ed American educated. The reforms, the energy reforms are very important. It's going to allow for foreign direct investment into energy. And imagine, Dan, if Canada with the XL Keystone pipeline, and so I think that's something we should think about when we think about the Western Hemisphere and getting that approved, um, the XL Keystone pipeline and having uh, increased energy investments in the United States and things like hydraulic fracturing, and then along with increased foreign direct investment in Mexico, if we had a regional energy power in North America, what would that mean in terms of our negotiations? He then took it and pivoted it to Europe and the Ukraine, and he said, what if we could offer Europe, who are in some ways um, constrained in what they can do in confronting Russia, if we said, we are going to produce so much energy that we can be your energy supplier so that you are not in hock to the Russians as you respond to what's going on in Ukraine. So that was his sophisticated analysis. So he sees, so Governor Christie, among others, has said, OK, there's a humongous opportunity for the United States if we think in regional terms and has geo strategic terms. That's not necessarily a vote-moving issue, but is very important for our foreign policy. Let me list, though, several things that I think are intermestic <coughs> issues and are going to be a little, that are showing themselves on the ballot. One is this issue in the challenges in Central America, which are partially uh, a result of poor governance, partially a result of corruption, uh, but also partially a result of a, of a two-way flow of gangs uh, weakening the state, and some of this is, is, is a U.S.-generated problem is causing uh, people to send their children on trains a thousand miles and put themselves in danger, thousands of children. So I think one of the ways in which this is going to show itself, it showed itself in July on the ballot, uh, we need to be thinking about how we respond to that, not just at the border where most of the energy has been, but how are we going to respond in a sophisticated way in Central America to helping resolve some of those longer term problems. The way we have looked at the problems in Colombia, 15 years ago if we'd had this conversation in this room or down at the old CSIS, we'd have said, oh, Colombia is a failed state. Colombia has got a bad brand. Nobody wants to invest in Colombia. Nobody wants to think about Colombia. 15 years later, people say, I want to invest in Colombia. Colombia is a, a well-governed state. It's an ally. Uh, and so that, a big part of that was America's engagement. But it was, it was something that was, in a variety of ways, through drugs or through insecurity being exported, uh, was something that was on the ballot and people were concerned about it 15 years ago, similar to the way in which some of the challenges in Central America are exhibiting themselves both as a security risk, an issue here in the United States, but it's also a development challenge. So energy, the challenges in Central America, and let me add just one more. I'm reading a very interesting book by my good friend and colleague here at CSIS, Gabriel Zini, called Educación 3.0. And Educación 3.0 is making the argument that for Latin America and the United States to progress and develop, we're going to have to have more sophisticated ways of vocational technical training and education. We're going to have to reform education. It's going to involve the private sector in a much more significant way, and we're going to have to think about the role of technology. And this is both a US challenge, and this is both a Latin American challenge. And that he, he made very elegantly links the two issues of both Latin America and the United States, and that education and training is going to be something that people do care about in, 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 as an issue because it has to do with their ability to progress. And so you see education come up from time to time, but I think linking the two is going to be something that is going to turn into an intermestic issue on the horizon. I'll stop there. Before we move on to Luis, a quick question. You mentioned yeah. Plan Colombia, yeah. right? Uh, one of the reactions to the crisis with the unaccompanied minors coming across the border uh, was people saying maybe we need a plan Honduras. Plan Central America. Uh, or a plan Central America. Um, did you have any initial thoughts on Yes, we, on we've that written sort of about that here. I've written about that um, saying that I'm very much in favor of a plan Central America. I mean, historically, 
the attention span for the United States on Central America is short. And so if you go back 30 or 40 years, we'll respond to a crisis and focus, and then we take our attention away. It's going to require the same sort of bipartisan extended focus the way we had in, in Colombia uh, over a 10 or 15 or 20 year period in Central America to make some sort of significant change on some of the problems of governance and corruption and security, as well as uh, plugging young people into uh, productive activities. Young people are either going to use their energies in unproductive ways or they're going to use their energies in productive ways. And it's in all of our collective interest to have them put, put, participate in uh, productive ways, if I can put it that way. Gotcha. Luis. Uh, so it's going to be hard to not be repetitive on this panel, but I think uh, in terms of the electorate, one of the things to, to keep in mind and that I think gets lost a lot in, in when you talk about the Hispanic community, the Latino vote, uh, is that it often gets thought of as something separate, something somewhat un-American. And I think uh, that one of the biggest challenges that we have as a community and as Americans is to try to break that down and, and really clarify what, what the actual uh, dynamics of this community are. Um, you know, there was a Pew study a couple of years ago that showed that a plurality of uh, non-Hispanic whites believed that most Hispanics were illegal. Uh, and, and that's a tremendous uh, statistic that really tells you what a disconnect there is between the perception of Latinos in the United States and what the reality of this community is. We're more than 50 million people who are of Latino origin uh, in the United States. Uh, the population of undocumented is only 10.7, 11 million, somewhere in there. Uh, and yet the perception that a plurality of non-Hispanic whites have is that most are, are illegal. And so that has to be rectified. There's 50,000 Hispanics who turn 18 every month, uh, potentially as much as 60,000. Mm. Um, and, and many of them, if not most of them, are going to be able to vote and register. I think where the conversation about Latin America and Latino issues comes into play is that many of them don't feel motivated, don't feel connected to the political system, uh, don't feel a sense of belonging um, or, or being reached out to uh, by politicians. And, and that's where we're going to have to make the switch. And part of what the politicians have to recognize is that these issues are not specific to that community, that they are important, as, as some of the other panelists have pointed to, to the broader <coughs> interests of the United States. Um, and that needs to be addressed uh, because it's important. So when you have issues like you know, the, the Republican shutdown of the government, you know, they affected security operations that were precisely targeted in Central America. For example, Operation Hammer that's meant to combat the transnational criminal organizations that are smuggling these people north. And yet then they, they uh, um, complain about the crisis at the border. So we have to start looking at how these issues are interconnected and how they affect um, the United States as a whole and not think of it as, you know, Latin America issues or issues that affect Hispanics. They're issues that affect our broader security, prosperity, uh, the trade that Carl was talking about. And start breaking down those barriers so that um, as politicians and as um, government officials look at Latinos, they don't see it as separate and distinct and checking a box, which is often what happens, especially in the political space, uh, but rather that they're embracing that. And I think that the candidates that are going to do well in districts and states where Latin American issues matter are those that recognize that and that are ahead of the curve. Um, and, and you already see that in many places. Florida is one of the best examples where Latin American issues often play a role, uh, but it's not only there. Uh, you know, Rhode Island actually has a very strong Colombian American community. Um, when the president decided to delay executive action on immigration, that had repercussions for the control of the Senate. And, and that's, I think, where we're going to have to um, start to look at that from the national picture is, oh, well, you know, Hispanics, uh, the conventional wisdom was Hispanics aren't really going to play all that big of a role in these elections. And so, you know, he can take that risk to protect uh, folks like Mark Pryor. Uh, but the reality is he may have actually done the opposite because you look at a state like Colorado, which has a very tight race, uh, Hispanics have a significant population there, 14% of the electorate in 2012. And uh, if they don't turn out, if they're not energized, if they're not motivated, uh, then you know, that could potentially cost control of the Senate. Uh, but it's also in other states where you may not expect that. In a state like North Carolina, where you have 9% of the population is Latino, but only 2% of the electorate uh, was Latino in 2012, well, guess what? That 2% can make the difference in a race that is within the margin of error right now. Uh, and that, again, could decide control of the Senate. Uh, but you certainly have that in plenty of other races. I mentioned Florida, <clears throat> uh, Latin American populations of US citizens in, in South Florida in particular are going to make the difference. 
you see a lot of uh, Colombian American and Venezuelan Americans who have traditionally been sort of a swing vote because they're recent immigrants, they're US citizens, uh, but they don't really have necessarily a strong affiliation with either party, um, and there's still an opportunity for both parties to capture them, especially in a state like that where Republicans have actually aggressively courted Latinos and Democrats have not. Um, the newer immigrants who are Venezuelan, Colombian American are up for grabs. And so uh, reaching out to them makes a difference and, and getting them involved. Um, Cuba, of course, continues to be an issue. And, and that's and beginning to shift. Uh, politicians are having to adapt to the reality that a lot of Cuban Americans who have come in the last 20 or 30 years um, actually want to go back, want to visit their families, want to be able to send them remittances and support their small businesses over there. And a lot of politicians are still clinging to hardline policies, which uh, is actually alienating some of those younger folks. Now, whether or not they're a big enough part of the electorate to swing, whether it's gubernatorial or, or congressional races, is yet to be seen. But that's a reality that candidates have to address and, and have to stay on top of. Um, and, and again, the, the candidates that are realizing and recognizing how these things adapt uh, earlier are the ones that are going to be successful and, and that begin to integrate their Hispanic outreach, um, not as, as uh, something separate, but integrated into their efforts. In, in your career, you've had contact with people involved in politics across the country. What do they tell you about this one fundamental question? Why Latinos aren't turning out in bigger numbers in elections? It's motivational, it's feeling connected. It's a sense of ownership. You look at uh, news coverage when uh, the Ukraine crisis was happening and at the same time Venezuela was uh, in, in absolute crisis and there was very little coverage in mainstream media of what was happening in Venezuela, if any at all. Mm. Um, and, and that really spoke to the disconnect between the mainstream media and the 50 million Latinos who are here who, again, have, have deep connections. All you have to do is compare a nightly newscast on Univision or Telemundo mm -hmm. with a nightly newscast on ABC, CBS, mm -hmm. or, or NBC, mm -hmm. and you see a completely different set of issues covered. Uh, Ukraine is certainly important. Uh, Syria is certainly important. Hispanics care about education and the economy. In fact, in polling, you regularly see economy and education outpacing immigration. Um, but they also want to hear about, about their countries of origin. One of the things that we had done uh, long before Mr. Christie's trip, is, which is a really good example of how some politicians are trying to get ahead of that curve. Um, in 2005, I actually traveled with Howard Dean to Mexico when they were in the middle of a presidential primary season. And we were making the case over there that whichever Democrat comes out uh, elected as president in the United States is going to be better for our relationship with Mexico than any of the Republicans. And, and that has reverberations. We understood that that's going to receive tremendous amount of coverage in Mexican media, in a lot of border media. It's heard in the, in the border states, um, and it reverberates. And, and, and that's something that candidates like Chris Christie are obviously recognizing and starting to do. Um, you know, if you want to reach a uh, population in Miami that's, that's South American, you can go to a radio like Caracol, which is Colombian and yet it has a lot of penetration into Florida and New York and even Los Angeles. Um, and so, um, you know, you have to be able to go out there and talk to them uh, about not just the issues that they care about that are domestic, but also the ones that they care about that are international and show them that you care enough about them being part of, of whatever effort you're making. Um, I think the biggest mistake people make is they'll hire somebody who is uh, Latino on a campaign and, and say, here, go talk to Hispanics. Mm. And, and, and sort of think that that has checked the box. Mm. Um, and that's not enough. I think diversity has to be all the way to the top. Um, you know, with, again, with Howard Dean, we had this thing where it was like, you know, if, just because you're black doesn't mean you can only talk to black people. Just because you're Hispanic doesn't mean you can only talk to Hispanic people. And yet our politics is still sort of caught in that, um, you know, ethnic type of, of um, approach that, that doesn't make a lot of sense and, and that doesn't really make people feel uh, like they're a part of the system. So part of it is just that the coverage and the general uh, conventional wisdom doesn't include a, a bigger set of what the population really looks like. Um, and the other part is just some candidates just haven't caught up. Gotcha. Gustavo, much of your work has been involved in business development that also has a, a component as a goal of poverty reduction. Why should an American voter, whether they're Latino or not, care about whether business is doing well in a Central American country or whether there are high rates of poverty there. And not only why should they care, um, but do you think that they do care? That's a, that's a great question. Um, 
A lot of Americans don't realize that Latin America and the Caribbean as a whole is our largest trading partner. Mm. Uh, we export more to that part of the world than any other part of the world. And um, roughly speaking about, I would say GDP per capita in the region on average is about a quarter of what it is in the United States. And so just imagine as that region continues to grow economically, uh, what that means for demand for US goods and services. So for that reason alone, I think it's important for us to make investments and to do it in smart ways. You know, I was at, at, the, at the IDB. One of the things I worked on was the new capital increase that went through the largest in the history of the IDB that doubled the lending capacity of the bank. And yet from the US taxpayer perspective, the commitment was $510 million uh, over, over five years. And that leverage- So 100 million a year. Uh, that's right, $102 yeah. million a year. But that leveraged an additional 50 to $60 billion in lending and investments to the region over 10 years. Folks, you can't get that kind of leverage you know, anywhere else, you know, quite frankly. So I think it's very smart to do it for, you know, for, for those reasons, but also because of what we saw at the border. Um, look, uh, the, the border with the United States and Mexico is about 2,000 miles long. I haven't measured it, but the, the border with Canada has got to be at least 50% or twice that. You don't have Canadians trying to get into the United States like you do folks from Latin America, and there's a reason for that. Canada's doing relatively well uh, economically uh, and from a security perspective. And so the more we invest, and of course we know the, the correlation between economic development and security, uh, th the more that folks there will decide to stay in their countries because that's, it's a very hard thing to leave one's country. You don't leave unless you really have to. You know, I was born in Cuba. My family felt compelled to leave Cuba uh, when they did. Uh, it's not something you do. It's a new language, new, new laws, new culture, et cetera. Uh, so, so that's another reason uh, that um, uh, we'll, have, um, you know, we'll have folks who want to stay in, in that region, and then you see how the immigration issue, the illegal immigration issue, you know, goes away to the extent that the, the region uh, grows. I mean, it's almost somewhat counterintuitive, isn't it? Uh, Dan mentioned that the question of Latin America isn't a front burner vote generating issue in the election in a lot of places. Yet it, ha yet it has been in other elections, right? NAFTA was a big campaign issue at one time. And here we have a larger Latino population and less of a focus on Latin America. And in another era, with a slightly smaller Latino population, a large focus. How do you explain that? Well, I, I think it has to do with, um, I mean, these are trends. I mean, right now the issue's been immigration. That's been the, the issue that's been in the media, in the spotlight, but I would, I, would, uh, I would say two things. One is these issues will grow in importance as the population grows, which is what we're seeing. The second issue is a little bit what Luis said, that you almost have had sort of a, the development of two parallel sort of media conversations here with Univision, with Telemundo, any night. If you just watch it, you see a whole bunch of issues having to do with regional issues. I don't think in 1991, 1990, you had that kind of uh, coverage uh, by Univision and Telemundo, or, or, or people watching it in 1990, 1991 like that. So I think there's been a change in sort of the context in which we're having this discussion. So it's not that these issues are less important. Um, I think that there's just a different approach to dealing with it. I would agree with what's been said here. There's a, a, a lack of a, um, I guess, a, a way of mainstreaming these issues. Mm. Uh, there's a separation here, uh, and you touched on it, and I think Dan touched on it too, is like, okay, you want to talk about Latin America stuff, you get someone who has a Latin American last name, and uh, a vowel the, at the right, end of well, the name. Yeah, and you right? check uh -huh. and you check the box, right? Mm -hmm. I don't think it's like that anymore. I think it's getting less and less like that. I think the issues that, I mean, ideally, what we'd like to see is that these issues are part of the critical mass of issues that a candidate would have to deal with, not that they would become Hispanic just, issues. The, <clears throat> Dan's absolutely correct that when you poll Hispanics and you ask them what are the most important issues, and by the way, I was not aware of the July issue, but I think that reflects the, the media coverage of what's happening on the border. But by and large, Hispanic Americans living in this country are no different than other Americans, right? They care about jobs and, and, and health care and education, those kinds of issues. But the immigration issue is important to them for social reasons. It's, you know, it's what I said earlier. Um, you feel that, in terms of party identification, you ask yourself, what party do I feel more comfortable with 
and what, what party do I think if I join or if I vote for, I'm going to be more, most, most welcomed? Uh, and I think the immigration issue sort of is akin to the civil rights uh, issues for black Americans in the 1960s and 70s. And you know, it's, 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 not, it's, it's not by coincidence that the vast majority of African Americans are democratic because they saw what happened in, those, in, in the debates and, and the social upheaval that we had in the 1960s and 70s. And I think that, I have to tell you, as a Democrat, as a proud Democrat, uh, I have been, um, uh, I mean, I'm stunned that the Republican Party hasn't done a better job of reaching out to Republicans. Now, there was a postmortem that was done in 2012 where they clearly identified this as an issue, and yet, look what's happened. Look what's happened in this immigration uh, debate. And so I think Hispanics are looking at this debate, and I think that, and so, them, so many of them are young, this is the time when, they're, when they are forming those opinions of party affiliation. Uh, and if Democrats are successful in, in grabbing them now, I think they're gonna have a hold on them for, for a long time. And, and something he's touching on that I think is important is fear, right? Because if you look at the NAFTA debate and why it had received so much attention back in 1994 when, when it happened. 20 um, years ago. It wasn't, it wasn't driven it by Latinos. Years. It wasn't driven by a Hispanic conversation. It was driven by uh, labor concerns over what it would mean for the loss of jobs and jobs yeah. moving to Mexico. So um, I think that that's a really great example of how we have to make sure that people understand mm -hmm. that Latin America issues are not specific to Hispanics. They're specific to mm -hmm. the general um, situation and, and benefit and prosperity of the United States. Um, and so it's a really good example. But it was also fear, fear of losing jobs that drove that issue and made it powerful. Yeah. It's fear of demographic change that's driving a lot of the anti-immigrant focus. And, and that's part of the challenge that I think immigration groups and pro-Hispanic advocacy groups have been um, great at, at bringing attention to the immigration issue. It's backfired in a certain way in that it's brought attention to the immigration issue in a way that makes people see Hispanics as foreigners. And a lot of Hispanics, whether it's in New Mexico, Colorado, Arizona, yeah. have been there for generations long before you know, yeah. um, those states were even part of the union. And so, so those are realities that we have to address and we have to, you know, there, there needs to be leadership in both parties, particularly in the Republican Party, that sort of looks at the very small minority, because let's face it, most Republicans are actually ready to vote for uh, immigration and to support um, a, a, even, uh, you know, the path of citizenship is the contentious part, but plenty of them even look at that. It's a very small minority that fears demographic change and that has to recognize that, again, th those that are not legal are a very small portion. Um, the country is not entirely changing. You look at Arizona, there was a, a village discovered, a 1,300-year-old village discovered in Arizona yesterday. And you know some of these folks would probably want to deport <laughs> everyone in that village because it's like, well, where did they come from, right? And, and, and that's sort of the attitude is like Hispanics in Arizona, Colorado, New Mexico were there for hundreds of years. And we have to tell that story. We have to make sure that they understand that Hispanics have fought in the Revolutionary War and the Civil War uh, on both sides. And, in uh, every conflict have been a part of the, the, the American fabric, um, and that doesn't get told. And so it allows for those issues of fear, and it has united Latinos. I think that it's becoming a sense of respect, right? So even if immigration is not your top issue, um, the way that it's talked about makes you feel that your entire community is under attack. And I think that's also what Latin American issues bring to it, is that when you address them, you give people a sense that we we, uh, we respect you enough to care about the other issues that you also care about. Yeah. yeah. So a couple things. One is I think the, the countries in Latin America have changed in the last 10 or 15 years. There's been, the last 10 years have been some of the best growth years for Latin America. We want those countries to, to succeed. We want to have the kind of sophisticated conversation with a Mexico or Peru that we have with South Korea or other countries that used to get assistance from the United States, even in Western Europe. And so, and I think that is happening. I think the kind of conversation when the governor of Quereto comes to Washington, he wants to talk about trade, he wants to talk about uh, higher education, he wants to talk about technology, um, and he wants to talk about how can I get people to stay in Quereto and prosper and succeed in Quereto, and how can I do that in a way that's mutually interesting for, all, for both of us. So I think it's, I think we're having a more sophisticated conversation. I do also think that, um, on things like trade, I think you know you you you'll have, certainly the Republican Party doesn't get a lot of credit uh, for its really excellent record on trade deals, uh, and I, I think it's a problem for the Republican Party if we're only talking on in Latin America about our trade record. I mean, I think I think there were 15 Democrats that voted for CAFTA in 2005. I can't remember, but I think there was I think the Bush administration pushed for Panama and 
the Colombian free trade deals. It took three or four years in this administration to actually get them done. Uh, President Bush you know, spent a lot of time on those. So I do think we don't necessarily get credit for, for those sorts of things. I also think, oftentimes I think the, the immigration debate is, is very divisive, but I also think there are divisions in both parties. I think of some, some parts of the African American community or, the, or labor unions that have not been as enthusiastic about immigration. And I think about the first two years of, of President Obama's term when he had uh, Democrats in both the House and the Senate and did not pass uh, comprehensive uh, immigration reform at that time. So I think it's, it's sometimes it's, uh, the Republicans are easy to scapegoat on some of this stuff, but I think it's a little bit more complicated than that on the one hand on immigration. And in terms of the changing, ch the changing trajectory of the societies in Latin America, the kinds of conversations that we're having are different. They want trade, but they also want more sophisticated discussions about um, education and training and infrastructure. And, so, and they want, as, as, um, as um, uh, my friends here are saying, that, that, they, that there's, a, there's an opportunity to, to prosper here and where, the, where, where, they, where they grew up as well. And so we want to have, have those sorts of, we want to have that kind of a mutually interesting dialogue or a mutually interesting conversation. I think we're getting there. And I think, you know, I think the last 10 years have been, have been part of changing the conversation because of the progress that's been made in Latin America. And part of the important shift there that I think matters is the diversity in government and in positions of power in media organizations, right? There's not a tremendously big Hispanic presence in, in government, certainly at the national level, um, and in media institutions. And so they tend to not look south. They tend to look still towards Europe. Or um, Asia. That's beginning to, or Asia. That's beginning to change to um, include more people, but it's not quite where it needs to be. But that's one of the things that we'll see change. And as educational institutions also begin to look south, right? So one of the big things this administration is trying to do is the 100,000 strong yeah. program, where they send more people to study abroad. Uh, you know, traditionally, when people want to study abroad, they think about uh, you know, the Parises and the Londons. And, and as more and more people start to go study and get comfortable with, so that it's not just the Hispanic, uh, Latino Americans that are, are, are heading south, but also more of, of just traditional. Um, populations that would otherwise go study in Europe begin to study in South America. I think that will help. And so you see those types of developments that are increasing the connections and the ties and that are going to lead to eventually those same people who may have studied in Bogota um, then be in a position at CNN or at the State Department yeah. where they can actually influence things. And that at makes CNN, a yeah. Or at one of the networks, right? Uh, but, but I would say on that note, on that note, I think there's a couple of things that need to be mentioned as we focus on the international and domestic issue. I think Dan uh, mentioned a little bit on the fact that uh, the Bush administration had nine free trade agreements uh, and had a budget of over $2 billion. And when you look at on the, foreign, on foreign, on foreign affairs to, to the, the region. region, when you look at the yeah. current administration, you see $1.5 billion, you see some of these programs like the one that you mentioned, which I think is, is important. But there has been a, and you know, this is very public, there has been sort of a pivot or to, to Asia. And there has been, in, in some circles, uh, or in some quarters, a questioning with regards to the commitment to dealing with some of these issues having to do with the region. The focus in the region has primarily been on Plan Colombia, the Merida Initiative, and has not really expanded into other areas as much. So on the one hand, you have a lot of folks in this country focusing on the immigration discussion and the root causes of that, which I think is an important issue to talk about. But the region, as it moves along, and I think you talked about it, Gustavo, a little bit, is, is interested in investment, is interested in, doing, in, in, in improving the, uh, the um, social mobility of its citizens, uh, education issues, a as mentioned. Uh, so there seems to be sort of a disconnect when it comes to this discussion with the administration. And I think that we are going to be forced to have this, uh, this discussion, regardless of Republican or Democrat, <laughs> simply because the region itself means so much to the United States, and it's starting to look at other places because we're not giving it the attention that we and should. And the 100,000 Strong, by the way, is privately funded. So <laughs> that speaks to that issue as well. Yeah. But if you look at the day-to-day -day government work of, of building the relationship, I mean, from 2009, there's been an emphasis on trying to develop stronger relationships with countries like Brazil, uh, countries like Colombia and, and, and um, Mexico. Uh, the free trade agreement with Colombia is a perfect example of the attempts to, to really foster that. Uh, so every day there is work that goes on that, but what you see is a shift at the top levels where the attention continually gets distracted from Latin America towards the Middle East, towards Europe, 
Um, and that certainly sends the wrong signal. I think even if there are people who every day try to strengthen the relationships on energy cooperation, uh, trade, and security, you still have a problem of perception uh, that I think needs to be corrected. You know, Secretary Kerry, one of his first mistakes was to say, to talk about Latin America as our backyard, um, and that certainly didn't mm. go over well. Uh, but Secretary Clinton, look, she visited uh, the region a, an unprecedented amount of times uh, among the millions and millions of miles that she logged as Secretary of State. A lot of those were to Latin America. Um, Secretary Kerry has not been as focused on, on Latin America, and, and that's certainly felt, I think, both inside the State Department and, and in Latin America. I do a lot of interviews where the first question I often get is, why doesn't the United States care about Latin America? I did one in Argentina the other day about the debt crisis and about um, you know, uh, Kirchner's speech at the United Nations. And, um, and he took the headphones off. <laughs> that was <laughs> and, big news in Argentina. And, and, and we're going to take the microphone and pass it into the audience and open up to some questions uh, so that they can ask you some of those things and some of the other things. So actually, given Christina Kirchner, I don't blame President Obama for having taken the headphones off, but that's just, <laughs> that's just me. Who wants to go first? Yes. Hello, my name is Jose Miguel Pulido. I work for Mitsui & Co. Uh, Chris Christie wasn't the only governor that went to Mexico. It was also Governor Jerry Brown of California. And President Peña Nieto went to California because, well, he called it the other Mexico. Uh, does this mean that at the local level, at least, we can trust that more uh, business development between governments will occur? Uh, or will that be more, or will we have to do that more through major FTAs? Thank you. I, I think that it's already happening mm. at the local level. California is one of the best examples of having a really strong relationship with Mexico and with some of the other border states where they recognize the mutual interest both in trade, security, border uh, issues. Um, you talked about gang trafficking yeah. and, and gangs, uh, multinational gangs a little while ago. Yes. Uh, the efforts that happen between the states, especially California and Mexico, are, are pretty commendable um, and, and how they're working together, not just on the government side, but bringing together uh, public and private interests to help deal with those issues. Mm -hmm. and, and if I can just add, it's also at the municipal level, you've got uh, yeah, well, you know, mayors going to visit mayors uh, in Latin America and the other way around, and at the business level, which is really where it's, it's most important. And I think one of the interesting trends is seeing uh, companies in Latin America, these multilatinas uh, and others who want to become multilatinas, realizing they want to expand, and they see the, the Hispanic market in the United States as being very attractive. So I think increasingly you'll, you'll see more and more, and we tend to think about doing business in Latin America as Americans going to do business in Latin America. I think increasingly you'll see more and more Latin American companies wanting to do business in the United States. Just, uh, just to I want to make a couple of points on this. I think it's very interesting. I do think a lot of uh, governors are, are seeing that as part of their role. Um, just a, a comment made about is Suzanne Martinez a fourth generation Mexican American. Her Spanish is beautiful. Uh, if you, you listen to her speak Spanish, it's great. Um, but in her, she has a distant relevant relative who was sort of a, I'm, I'm going to put this the wrong way, but it, it was sort of a was a a second level hero in the Mexican Revolution. So as a household name in Mexico, as something equivalent to sort of Samuel Adams here or Paul Revere. And so when she goes to Mexico, people know who she is, but she speaks great Spanish, but also, you know, she, you know her family's been here over 100 years, but, uh, but, or close to 100 years, but her, she, had a, she had a relative who had, had some connectivity to the history of Mexico, and so people connect with that. And, um, but it's very interesting. You'll have governors in Michigan or governors in Maine who make trips to Mexico. It's not just the border states, but see this as a market, I think, uh, Somewhat to Gust Gustavo's point, that they, they see themselves this is this is part of their role as as governors is to be ambassadors for their for various industries. For example, in Maine, the um, I asked this question uh, at a meeting, and and the current governor of Maine, who's a Republican, said uh, ninety percent of Maine is forest. We are jump starting the paper and pulp industry in Maine with a Mexican paper and pulp firm who's investing in Maine. So this is an example of it's not just California, New Mexico anymore. And because of what I was saying earlier about the changing dynamics, the changing economics in, in these countries where you're having investment going the other way, it's sort of an interesting, it's an interesting twist. We're in, a, we're in a different world in a different place. And so even in a place like Maine, you're seeing this. And so governors absolutely have to be doing this as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then green. <laughs> 
Hi, my name is Ellen Street, and I work for DSF Consulting. Um, I'm interested in, in unemployment in the workplace, especially for young people, and I was curious how we could start that conversation, both in Latin America and the USA, between um, higher education, high schools, and the workplace. Sure, you wanna take that? Okay. So I think, just going back to this issue of, of where countries are in their economic development, they want, it, it, there's a challenge in development around the middle income trap, and so one of the ways you get out of it is to increase people's productivity, and so one way to increase people's productivity is about education. So when the Governor Cadeto came to, to Washington, and met with Carl and I and some others, he wanted to talk about higher education partnerships, he wanted to talk about community college partnerships. President Bush certainly did this, President Obama's talking about this. So I think this is absolutely important at one level is higher education, but I also think this issue I was talking about earlier about gangs, we're gonna need to find, young people are gonna either, whether it's in LA or whether it's in Tegucigalpa or whether it's in, um, uh, or somewhere else, young people are gonna use their energies for productive activities or unproductive activities. And we want them to be using for productive activities. Well, that is not just a, a challenge for the state it's, or, or for foreign aid providers, it's about getting companies involved, it's about getting your community and churches involved. Uh, it also means, I think, also thinking about ways, new ways of training and education that may not necessarily be, especially folks who leave um, the, the formal education system. This book that I mentioned earlier by Gabrielle Zini, I think touches on this. I highly recommend it to you if you're interested in this topic. It's Educacion 3.0. It's just come out by Gabrielle Zini, Z-I-N-N-Y. And that beats a starred Amazon review right there. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. starred Amazon review right there this, on this exact topic. Do we have another question? I think there was one in, in the, yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, my name is Belen Marquina. I work for the Hispanic Heritage Foundation. I had a question about how can politicians frame this, um, this platform of investment in Latin America. I think it's very hard to make the case uh, of long-term investment because we are used to seeing retribution immediately. And I think it's hard to convince folks that we need to invest to increase security socially and economically, and it'll benefit us. How can they create this platform? Sounds like a good one for the bank guy on the panel. So, you know, one way is um, you're talking politicians in a democracy, which is what we have in the United States, and you want to be able to appeal to the interest uh, of, the, of, your, of the voters. Um, and so to the extent that uh, in different districts, if you're talking about the, the House of Representatives or you know, the state, the, at the Senate level, um, that you have uh, significant parts of the population that still have family in Central America, for example. Uh, I would think it's a very attractive case to make that we should be investing uh, in that region for security reasons and also because in a sense, you're helping your family members, you're, you're helping your, your friends who are still there. And you hear about this, right? You, you, um, uh, you know, you communicate with these individuals, you know how difficult the times are there. And so I think it's an attractive measure, uh, message to send. And by the way, these are investments that we're making. I mean, through the IDB, for example, uh, the IDB lending to sovereign countries uh, has never experienced a default. That's why it's a AAA rated institution. So these are not grants that we're making and, you know, we're hoping for the best. Uh, these, these are investments that we're making that, that get paid back. Uh, so the, the principal is paid back as well as the, uh, as well as the interest. Um, and then otherwise, you know, a, a larger, if you look at, um, companies, small, small and medium-sized enterprises in the United States, um, a greater percent of those that are owned by Hispanics actually trade to Latin America or actually are involved in foreign, uh, in, in, in exports versus uh, your, your average, let's say, uh, SME. Uh, so I think that's also a case you can make uh, and try to help and try to create government programs and working with private institutions in order to promote exports by small and medium-sized enterprises. I, I, would, I would add also, I mean, there are a lot of companies all over the region, Colombia and Brazil and Chile and Mexico, that are competing globally. So this is not, this is not just uh, to bolster security or you know, the sides that have to do with assistance, as much as these are just smart business decisions. Uh, the region is now growing uh, in a way that it hasn't before. It's a very diverse region. You have issues where there are problems like uh, with the ALBA countries, with Venezuela, for instance, it's, it, you know, where the business environment isn't the best for investment. But in other places, uh, Brazil in particular, and Chile, the countries of the Pacific Alliance, for instance, uh, it's Chile, Colombia, Peru, and Mexico. I mean, these countries have environments and regulatory frameworks that are much more 
uh, attractive to businesses, not just from the United States, but from all around the world. And I think it's an attractive sort of case to make as well that you know if we want to uh, take off in the region if we want to have better relationships with those multilatinas, if we want to be able to really hit the ground in a place where we're going to be able to get return on investment, we have to be in these countries. It's not just an issue of bolstering American security in Central America, for instance, and I think there's a case to be made, and Gustavo, I think you've made a very good point, but it's also putting Latin America in the global framework of investment. And it's very relevant in that uh, regard, and uh, I think we need to talk about that and as well. Our, and our national leaders need to realize that they need to invest time and effort because all of these things reverberate, right? So I, I brought up the Argentina example. One of the things I said there is that uh, South Americans also need to recognize that if they want to be taken seriously on the world stage and get a Security Council seat, um, they also need to be serious about threats like ISIS and the fact that they're not just threats to the United States or to Israel, but that they're really global threats. Um, and so they have a responsibility. And on that note, there is no Latin American country that is in the coalition that the United States is organizing right now to combat uh, ISIS all around the world. And, but, but the presence in Latin America, that's why it's also important for the yep. United States to take that leadership, not just at the assistant secretary mm -hmm. level at state, but really from the very top. Um, this administration now has designated <laughs> Vice President Biden to be the point person on Latin America on the really major issues. And that's a good step because he's become more engaged. Um, he's in a lot more contact. And, and that's important. Um, but really, we, as much as the South Americans need to take responsibility, we need to realize that we need to elevate our outreach so that we're both investing, so that we're promoting small businesses mm -hmm. and growth and, and the economic prosperity that helps both sides, but also preventing, uh, you know, creating a vacuum that allows uh, foreign threats to also enter through, through Latin America. I think Dan was champing at the bit just there. A just a couple of things. Yeah. One is, is uh, that um, uh, I think this issue of what Carl was saying about that it's in our mutual interest. I think, again, this issue of, of Governor LePage in Maine talking about Mexican investors restarting the paper and pulp industry, I think is a sort of an interesting, this, is, this isn't a one-off. I think you're gonna see a lot more of this and it's a lot more sophisticated. I, uh, I think about the first Bush administration, Bush 41, where Argentina sent a, a ship in the first Gulf War. I mean, I think there are examples where in the past, Latin America has, Brazil contributed in World War II uh, to the Allied cause, and so I think I El hope Salvador El and the Iraq War. El Salvador and Colombia was and the, the Iraq first, War uh, was the first Colombian death in Korea. Yeah, exactly. We have right. a question so, here so, from the gentleman in the striped purple shirt. Yeah. Thank you, Hector Chamis, uh, Georgetown and El País. Uh, I, I was wondering, along the the lines of the recent couple of comments, if you could speculate a little bit on potential changes in U.S. foreign policy to Latin America, aside from Latinos, immigration, all of that, but concrete, you know, apropos Carl's comment on uh, Obama's coalition at the U.N. and whether Latin America has been there or not. But in the event of a change of uh, control of the Senate, which is what is at stake, and, and, and there's not going to be any change in the House, if you could speculate about any possible changes in, in U.S. foreign policy given that. Sure. Well, I mean, if we had a if we had a Republican-controlled Senate, it would mean that voices like Marco Rubio and Mario diaz balart is likely going to be one of the two candidates to have control over an important subcommittee on on foreign operations. Uh, so he's one of the two folks. Uh, the other person who's in the running for that is Andrew Crenshaw. They're both from Florida. Um, you know, so again, uh, I think you'd have a series of very thoughtful people. I also think you'd have a, a bigger appetite for more trade deals. I think the Republican Party's. Been, I think is known as a, a pro-free trade party. I think if you have Essio Neves, fingers crossed, uh, win the elections in Brazil, I think you could have a hemispheric trade agreement. So I think you'd have, you'd have, the, you'd have the appetite in the Senate to get a hemispheric trade agreement. You'd have a, you know, so if President Obama wanted to have a legacy project, if you had the right, you know, this could be a, you'd have a very pro-free trade uh, uh, Congress for that. I also think you'd have an increased appetite and interest in, uh, or certainly I think there'd be ongoing increased interest to do something about trying to, to deal with the challenges, the root challenges in Central America, similar to the way you had in a Republican Congress in helping support Plan Columbia when President Clinton was, was president. Let, I have me, a different let me just let me just hold on. Let me just say one thing. Let me just, and we'll get right to you. Um, yeah, you know, to go uh, with what some of what my Republican brother just said. Um, I think the real issue is going to be immigration reform. And I think that we have a uh, 
sort of window because of the presidential election that uh, I think a lot of people are going to be putting pressure on resolving immigration form, that being uh, dealing with root causes of why children are yeah. coming, yeah. that being dealing with the security uh, side of it, or that being dealing with undocumented people that are in the United States. I think that's one issue. You mentioned Brazil. You mentioned the possibility of Aysu Neves uh, winning uh, or being the president. The big issue with Brazil is a tax treaty. A tax treaty, a framework for uh, U.S. And, Mex and Brazilian business to be able to do business easier. I think that's another one. Keystone, pipeline, Western Hemisphere issues, the question of the pending uh, uh, decision. That's another one that's very relevant. Uh, I think that it's important to be realistic. We can speculate as much as we want up here, and obviously we're going to have our own interests in the agenda. But the next two years are going to be very, um, we used to talk about it when I was in the Senate, on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, it's the silly season. It's going to be very difficult to get some of these things done. I think there's interest in all of us, and I think we're all interested in Latin America here, in getting more of this stuff done. But it's important to temper these ambitions with reality. And my Republican brother, I agree with you. So <laughs> I was going to echo that, that sense of reality, which is that over the next two years in, in a Republican-controlled Senate, you'd see very little get done. But again, I wanted to bring it back to why we're here, which is the midterm elections. Or a Democrat. And, and I mean, I, I, <laughs> frankly, I, I, we're I disagree gonna keep with it, that. It's going to be a split Congress, even if Democrats <laughs> win the Senate. Yeah. So, so the likelihood of a lot happening there is, is not high. I think you're right about the silly season. But to bring it back, I think this is why we need to continue to work on diversity at every level. Um, Democrats in congressional races are starting to get that message. Um, they have not released their numbers yet, but I can tell you that the diversity in uh, staffing in congressional races is better than I think it's ever been. Um, and that's, that starts to translate, right? It starts to translate into there being a bench that eventually, you know, they played a role as field organizers or field directors, and you know, then they become campaign managers, and then they join the presidential race as a state director, and then eventually they're political director at the next one. And, and you're going to start seeing that as as that bench deepens and these people gain more experience, um, whether or not they make the impact that we would all hope they make in this election, they're going to be making the impact in the next one and the one after that. Uh, and so building that bench of diversity uh, that we're starting to see, particularly in congressional races right now, is going to make a huge difference. Quick comment yeah, by Gustavo, to, and we've got time for then one more question. So we've been here for about an hour, and I think it's fascinating what we have not talked about. Right, 15 years ago, we would have been talking about drugs, democracy, corruption. I think that speaks to yeah. how far Latin America has come. I agree. Uh, and how I think the narrative is changing from those bad negative things. Immigration is still an issue, but the more positive agenda, which is how we can work together more closely with Latin Americans and how we can both benefit economically from a growing and import, an important and growing uh, trade relationship. Well, like Colorado and Washington are certainly going to affect the drug legalization conversation with Latin America. So. And final question there in the back. A lot of pressure. <laughs> Thank you. I'm Maria Pena with La Opinion. Um, since we are talking about the midterms, you know, I hear a lot of optimism and enthusiasm on uh, voter turnout, but the statistics don't bear that out. I mean, Naleo is already saying that only 7.8 million Hispanics are going to turn out, and Hispanics traditionally don't come out on the midterms, so that may end up hurting Democrats. You know, and immigration, you're right. Um, they've said they're upset about the delay in immigration measures, and this is going to end up hurting Democrats. Polls suggest that Republicans are getting closer to regaining the Senate. So I'm wondering if you could uh, elaborate a little more about why it is that Hispanics are really feeling let down and they, they're not going to come out and vote, considering the potential. I mean, for decades, we've been talking about the sleepy giant and the potential for their political cloud, but it hasn't, you know, it hasn't come out yet. Yeah, I was talking about diversity in hiring. I, I don't suggest that there's a lot of excitement. It's actually one of the challenges that I hear every single day from campaigns across the country is how do we motivate these voters? Um, and part of that is telling them what's at stake. You know, um, the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, has lowered the uninsured rate among Hispanics from uh, the high 30s to the 20s. Um, and so all of those people who now have something to lose, they need to be made aware that that, that kind of thing is at stake. Um, they need to understand what's at stake economically and financially um, and, and really compare what the economic policies mean for that particular community in that particular district. Uh, so I think that the challenge for Democrats is to really connect 
um, what difference it's going to make for those particular voters. Um, and immigration is a headwind. I think I, I mentioned it at the beginning of this panel. I don't know um, uh, if, you know, it's been a long hour, but at the beginning of that, I, I was talking about the fact that the president may have actually hurt himself with the delay in states like Colorado and North Carolina, even where it's within the margin of error and Hispanics can make the difference. So there's definitely an enthusiasm problem, um, but it starts with. Uh, reaching out and making people feel that they matter, not just in the Czech Latino box, but really for the priorities of that particular candidate. It's going to have to be done uh, one at a time. And on that particular note, I would say that it's an, it's an opportunity for Republicans. Uh, and it's an opportunity to go from the rhetoric, which we've seen a lot with Democrats on the immigration issue, to action. And I think that that's something that's going to be, um, that Republicans, if they do take the Senate, uh, are going to be uh, judged on, on this issue. I think that it's an issue of growing imp interest and growing importance, um, and uh, I think it's an opportunity. But right now, and just in closing, I guess, the Latino vote is more up for grabs now than in what it's ever been. Would you agree with that? I agree with that. I think the Democrats have made a big mistake in not being more aggressive. Um, again, you have the Mark Priors of the world dominating and affecting national decisions instead of the Udalls who are, uh, have a bigger Hispanic constituency. And so Democrats have definitely put themselves in a difficult scenario where uh, they should be able to capitalize on this constituency, but it is not 100% uh, sealed. Look, you know, I think that Republicans, on the other hand, are missing an opportunity, as you talked about, not just for the next cycle, but even in the lame duck session. Um, they misread the Cantor loss, you know. Uh, for them, it was like, let's not deal with immigration because clearly it's a loser, when what they should have been looking at was let's deal with immigration now so that we don't continue to have our cantors being challenged by the fringe because at the end of the day, um, the Latinos aren't going to go away. The dreamers aren't going to stop protesting. They're not going to stop showing up at these members' events and, and challenging them on the stump. And uh, at the end of the day, if Republicans get this out of the way uh, in the lame duck session, they don't have to deal with that. They take it off the table so that the primaries on the Republican side don't have to focus on immigration, so that members like Cantor aren't being challenged. And they would be smart to do that rather than to continue to drag it out. Well, write all that down, and we'll check it in six months. <laughs> no, no prediction, then. No, close, or, close or 75 to years. Or in 35 years, exactly. <laughs> well, I think we should uh, offer a round of applause to our panelists. Um, <laughs> thank you all. Thank you all for coming and participating. And C-SPAN was here, too, so you can relive it.